Hey everybody, welcome back to the new videos channel and today we're looking to yet another performance tip for Nox.js that you don't have to do anything for and just get out of the box. Here we go. When building our applications out there, performance is key to keep in mind. No matter if it's a public facing e-commerce application or like your, I don't know, internal user dash dashboard, because it still matters whether the site loads 50 seconds or two right? Not only for buying customers, but also maybe the people on their old phones, etc, etc. And there is a lot to do in userland. We all know that, right? But the good part is that Nuxt or the framework of your choice, which hopefully is Nuxt, right? That's why you're here, is bringing you a lot of performance optimization out of the box. And that's great. And there are some more coming. And especially in this video, I want to talk about the performance optimization that will ship probably in the next minor that you can already load as a module and it will help you if you use pre-rendering. Let's check it out. Our demo Nuxt application is, well, almost as minimal as possible. We have a Nuxt config that has just some style changes for our, well, very naive dark mode and the compatibility date. And then we have a few things here in our app folder because we use the new Nuxt 4 structure. It's no problem. You can also do the same in Nuxt 3 without the app folder and you're good. Here we have our index.view. We have an about.view. They both have just an h1 in there and an error.view with a place hodler. Yeah, typo. Uh, or not, pun intended. Um, and the idea here is to just remove the pre-generated error page. Why we do that? Well, because we want to take a look at the uh, bundle later on and that would just skew the bundle a little bit, but no problem at all. So we have our simple application. We also have an hello endpoint here in server API that just says hello next four and we're good to go. Now what we want to do is, well, we want to create here a little data fetcher. So as usual, we do script setup, right? We can do language TypeScript. Of course, we want to do that. And then we close the script tag here and we want to use const data equals, we can use use fetch, but actually let's use use async data here. Use use async data. We give it a key, very important. Let's just say index, uh, not the most descriptive one, but it works. And here we have our custom fetcher function. Now, commonly, uh, what people would use is $fetch, right? So from ofetch here, we can say, let's fetch our slash API slash hello, we return the whole thing, and we're good to go. This would work. We can just render our data in here. So like, okay, let's put out the data and we're good. But for this example, I want to go a bit more custom because a lot of times people use even third-party fetching libraries, like their own generated HTTP client, some older things, etc. And this is where things can make a difference. Let's have a look. And for this example, I use a package that you hopefully haven't heard a long time, and it is Axios. Yes, we go and get Axios from Axios, and instead of dollar fetch, we say axios.get. And this is more or less our custom fetcher function here. Now we could also say, okay, we do a few different things, etc., etc. What we want to do now is we want to check the impact of Axios on our bundle. So what we do is we run pnpm nuxt analyze that will work in all the next projects and it will start and analyze build and then actually show the bundle size in the browser. So now that it's done, let's jump to localhost and check our client build. And this is our client build. The first thing we usually do is change to broadly because this is the actual transferred size. So this is a bit more realistic. Uh, you can also keep it at gzip if you don't support broadly, but well, but most pages should nowadays or on rendered. As you see, the difference is kind of negligible, but it's still better to see in my opinion what the user actually gets. And then we have our chunks here. We have the entry chunk, right? Then the index page. And we also have here about the JS with just 105 bytes. Yes, but we see index is quite big, uh, even though it only contains, well, one H1 element and then the Axios call. So here we see, all right, index JS 20.32 kilobyte. And that's mainly because Axios itself is 18. And then we have a few more things here that are needed. But the main thing is Axios. So what can we do here to reduce that? And to be honest, this depends a lot on your application. If you have to use a third party fetching library that's not already built in because dollar fetch is used internally, which means lower bundle as you can just reuse the module. Well, that's fine. Like sometimes you have to do that. And sometimes it might be easier for DX or for integrating whatever you have there. But especially when pre-rendering a site, this fetching library might not be needed. So let's think about it for a second. 
Before we actually pre-render our page, we have to do a few tweaks regarding our Axios call here. The first thing is we have to add a then clause and then actually make sure to return our data. So we actually return only the JSON and not the whole Axios object, which will have circular imports. And well, this will just go wrong or circular references to be precise. The other thing we want to make sure about is that Axios also knows the base URL. So commonly the base URL, we can just say, okay, we know this is example, um, we just go for localhost 3000. But commonly you do something like use runtime config and then say something like, okay, let's call this and get public uh, base URL. Or, well, if it's not available, you would just take a default. Um, you can also set a default, of course, in your actual nice.config. We talked about that in another runtime config video. But uh, now what you want to do eventually is take the base URL and concatenate this with our uh, relative path because dollar fetch can easily do that but axios can't it can't infer that on the server side so now we are on the safe side and things should work and we can jump into a browser to verify that real quick and here we go what you want to see is this hello next four from our fetching library now just to make sure that this works uh, we're good to go and now we want to pre-render the site okay and to now pre-render our site all we have to do is running npm generate or npm next generate that's um, the shorthand that's usually in your npm script so in a package json already and we're rendering all of this and we're good to go here and now we see some interesting parts because well first of all if we take a look at the output folder then we see that we have for example here a payload.json for our index page and a page.json for our about page and the about page has no extra data, that's why there's nothing in there, right? But for our index JSON, well, we have the data that was pre-rendered, which is this part. Here, hello next for message, referring to that. We have the index key from our used async data that says, okay, in the third position, this is here, fourth position, here we go. And eventually this is just a pre-rendered at uh, point, which is indicated here. So now we have this payload ready. And if we would serve up the page by just running npx serve that output public and going to a browser, let's have a look what actually happens under the hood. If we now reload the page, then we should see a few calls coming in. Actually, the first time the call to the HTML here in localhost, and then we see our payload being fetched, right? So here we have the response giving exactly what we've seen before in the DevTools. But interestingly, there is no call to any kind of API endpoint. And that's not because we said localhost 3000 or similar, that's mainly because we pre render the site and everything in use async data that's running on the server or also use fetch. Well, that is just inserted into the payload and then on the client side, it will not be refetched because the data is there throughout the payload. So actually we don't even need this fetching library, whatever you use there at all. The problem is, as we've seen before in our chunk graph on our, our tree chart, it is still included. So for pre-rendered side, we have the big problem that we ship a lot of unused JavaScript. You might wonder, why do we ship that at all? And the reason is that there might be, well, dynamic pages in SPA style that you still want to load um, and actually call APIs. Or if for whatever reason, the payload couldn't be generated, you want to have a fallback to actually call the existing API. But in the happy case, right, in the good paths, that's not necessary. So there is a way to extract these like, heavy fetching functions, no matter how they look like, over into an extra chunk. Let's do this. And to do so at the time of recording, we can add an extra module and this module is called Nuxt Rebundle. Of course, make sure to also install it in your package JSON. So that should be in here, it's version 002. And yes, I know, I promise you don't have to change anything. We'll talk about that in a second. First, let's see what happens if we just run the same thing as before. We run a pmpm analyze and see what comes out in our wonderful tree chart. Okay, and here we have the actual new chunks and the new tree chart. So to comparison, this was the old one. We only had blue and red and a tiny bit over here, a tiny bit of green, which is negligible. And now in our new chart, we have a few new colors, actually one major big color, which is this, this purple. The about thingy is still here, it's still around, and then we have here index. And as you see, index.js got way smaller over here. It kind of is almost not there anymore. Instead, all of this like big Axios thing was moved to this async data chunk part here. And this is actually what the Nux rebundle module is doing. So instead of keeping everything in your pages or even components, 
it will make sure to extract all these heavy functionalities over in their own chunk. Then the chunk can be loaded as needed and most of the time it's not needed. So you save on JavaScript. And if it's needed, it's not a problem. It's just one chunk away. Now, why you shouldn't do this by default and only for pre-rendering is why I mentioned before. If you do it by default, then we always have to request that chunk, the server, also on the client, because you actually want to fetch the data. But on pre-rendering, the payload is already there, so in most cases, you simply don't. Taking a close look at the module, it is from the one and only Daniel Rowe, of course, again. And it's quite experimental, it's work in progress right now, and it will split out these use async data fetcher functions into async chunks. The good part is you don't have to do anything, as we've seen before, we just installed the module and you're good to go. You can also use this wonderful Nuxi command for that to add the module and it's fine. But yeah, I know, I promised you don't have to change anything. And in the upcoming Nuxt version, that's actually the case. I, I don't lie here, right? So let's have a look at the PR that's upcoming. And this PR is still in draft says feed Nuxt, comma schema, extract async data handlers to chunks. It's also from Daniel Rowe coming quite, quite fresh, right? Still in draft, but the idea is to port over Nuxt tree bundle because it was successfully tested nux.com for a while, also tested it on a couple other pages, and it is more or less happening what we've described and seen in the video before. This heavy function that is used is then just moved over into a new chunk and we're good to go. How this is implemented, of course, you can have a look in the whole PR. The link is as usual in the description. The most interesting part is, of course, this extra plugin. And as usual, this is an unplugin, then here, it's, it's basically based on Rollups API, right? With a few things in addition, we'll say, okay, we'll track all the async data over here, count for that. Uh, if there's a source in the using async data, just return the source, we're good to go. We're loading, also checking that ID, and then we have the transforming part, which is where actually the things are moved over from these like heavy function calls over into generated chunks. So we check first, of course, okay, what do we wanna exclude? What do we include? All fine. And then we have a lot of, well, walking the abstract syntax tree, taking a look what's available, if there's a call expression identifier, if not, well, we can go ahead, finding these functionalities, making sure to adapt that and putting all of that in a new chunk eventually. So at the very end, we can also here have an override for chunks, we omit certain things and we're good to go. This is just a high level overview. Of course, if you're interested in the details, let me know in the comments, we can also walk through a bit more detailed. Uh, or if you have if any questions, also feel free to comment the PR. There might be some use cases that might be covered as usual. So if you hit any of these already, then uh, give it a go. And yeah, this is one of the things how you can improve your performance of pre-rendered pages already right now. The best part is don't worry if you use things on the client side to fetch stuff, it will be fine uh, and it should not be extracted for you. So there, that's a big win. Uh, and if you don't wanna change anything right now, the best part is just wait and you get there as well. Fully up to you if you're busy with fixing bugs and shipping features or shipping bugs and fixing features. You know what I mean. Anyway, uh, that's it for today. Any questions in the comments as usual? See you next week or maybe um, we see each other at the conference coming up. Uh, let's see. Uh, otherwise, there's some more videos around and um, until then, happy hacking. See you soon. <laughs>